All right, hello everybody. My name is Carl Millis. I'm from the Center for Astrophysics and Space Sciences. And judging from the theme of my talk, uh, the general theme of the workshop thus far, of how living, living organisms impact the planet, you might expect some of these lively characters here to appear in my talk. Thankfully, I'm not that crazy, and neither are the workshop organizers. And I hope that you'll find that the extraterrestrial threats I'm going to discuss today with you are a lot more relevant and important than alien space invaders. So uh, we live in a time of where technology permeates and improves our lives, uh, like my friend here, Joe Schmo, enjoying his cell phone call during my talk, which is rude, so I'll ask him to go outside. There he is now. Uh, technology, uh, Joe and others may not be so aware, is that uh, our technology is very vulnerable to our space environment. So for example, in this sense, our sun is a bit of an enemy in that it has regular uh, ejections, uh, flares, uh, bursts of particles that come to the Earth. Now these can uh, damage and sometimes even cripple our satellites, which then can uh, have disastrous, possibly disastrous impacts on the services that we use on an increasingly more day-to-day -day basis. Uh, it doesn't have to stop at the atmosphere, of course. It can also permeate down to the ground. Uh, if you need examples, the 1989 solar storm uh, was able to compromise the electrical grid in Quebec. The 1859 solar storm actually caused telegraph light poles to spark and explode. If an 1859 sort of solar storm event happened today, it's estimated that the damage would be in the order of trillions of dollars worldwide. And our government is very savvy to this, and for the past several years, they have invested uh, copious amounts of resources into trying to understand the impact that these sorts of events would have on our technological society and understanding their source in the sun. Now, it's worth pointing out that our sun's activity in terms of the sunspot cycle had just peaked recently, uh, and the sun gave a great interest to that just last month with an X class, which is the most energetic class of flare uh, giving off. Now, of course, it doesn't take the most energetic flares to hurt us. Uh, even during solar minimum, flares can come and, and have to perturb our satellites. Thankfully, this recent X-class flare did not get pointed right at Earth, but if it did, we do have a natural defense in our ma magnetic field, which can divert and sometimes concentrate the damage away from our satellites. So the Earth's magnetic field is generated deep in the Earth's interior from the motions of the liquid part of our Earth's core. And so if we want to understand the shield from the sol's, uh, sun's effects, we need to understand the processes deep within the Earth that generates this. So Professors David Segman, Lisa Tux, and Catherine Constable at Scripps invest significant amounts of time in trying to understand these processes and how it affects the generation of the Earth's magnetic field. Now, the magnetic field itself is not a static body. It, it changes in structure, as evidenced from this figure over here, showing the slow wander of the north magnetic pole to the north and sort of to the west. It also changes in its strength. And this image here from Catherine Constable is showing, in a 20-year period, the general decrease in magnetic field strength of about of several percent. Over the past 200 years, magnetic field strength has decreased by, I believe, by an order of about 10 to 15 percent. So if we want to understand and predict what's going to happen to our magnetic field and its ability to protect us from the sun's effects, we need to understand its history. And so both Lisa Tess and Catherine Constable invest a lot of time into paleomagnetism and archaeomagnetism to understand the history of our Earth's magnetic field and make models of what will happen next. Well, of course, if we want to get to the heart of it, the beast is the sun, and we need to understand what it's doing and what it can do to us. So a significant amount of effort in the United States and abroad goes into space weather forecasting. Here at the Center of Astrophysics and Space Sciences, Dr. Bernard Jackson has built and sent into space an instrument called the Solar Mass Ejection Imager, which for about a decade surveyed the skies looking for coronal mass ejections. Analysis of this data and modeling thereof then led to uh, space weather forecasting that his group does. This product is used not only by our own government in order to predict the effects of the sun on our technology, but also by other nations, governments, uh, for example, Korea, who are very keen on trying to make their own space models and, and figure out what the sun might do to us. A more unpredictable uh, space threat comes in the form of asteroidal impacts, and this should be relatively fresh in most of your minds thanks to the Chelyabinsk event just last year. And in case you need to be more reminded of it, I've got a nice video here. So you'll see a flare up that's the results of the air burst. So this is actually the asteroid exploding as it enters through the atmosphere, or as it ends its uh, trajectory. And then in a few minutes are going to be cut out of the video as we wait for the shock wave to propagate. and impact with the buildings in the town of Chalabings. Now, the amount of damage caused by this event is estimated to be on the order of 100 million US dollars. 
uh, significant amount. So how often can we actually expect these sorts of impacts to occur? And that's actually a topic of lively debate. So this most recent publication in Nature in 2013, which took, uh, had contributions from uh, researchers at Scripps, found that the flux of these sort of Chalybinks size objects could be about an order of magnitude larger than what earlier predictions had suggested. Uh, so this could mean that there are a, a lot more of these things, and the airburst damage they can generate with these shock waves means that all of the residual risk in terms of asteroidal impacts is around this size range here. So much like with the sun, if we want to understand this threat well, we need to be able to form a, a cohesive story of how these objects formed and evolved throughout the history of our solar system. So my own research concerns uh, the collisional history of rocky objects and planetary systems. In my specific case, I'm using observations of other planetary systems where these events are happening in real time. Uh, in other departments, Professor Mark Tiemens, Professor James Day, and Dr. Subracha Chakraborty are using the chemistry of solid formation to investigate how these, object, how these solids form and what their migration history throughout the planetary system is. And at Scripps, they're actually counting up the number of these events as they're occurring using the US Array Infrasound Network. Uh, some of that data was used in the previous plot I showed. And uh, using their network of seismoacoustic devices, they're able to actually count these things up and measure the amount of energy imparted into the atmosphere as these things go. And this particular example is showing the Chelyabinsk event here. So of course, it's nice to be able to catalog these things and at least ha know what the, the potential threat is. But it would be really nice if we could actually do something about it besides sitting and twiddling our thumbs waiting for it to happen. So a lot of effort throughout the world right now is going into mitigation strategies for removing asteroidal threats once we become aware of them. So Professor Philip Lumen in UC Santa Barbara is actually developing a concept that he calls DE star. DE stands for directed energy, not death. In this particular example, uh, you are collecting sunlight using photovoltaics or solar panels. And then you are using, directing that energy using lasers, uh, phased coherent lasers that can actually focus a spot a laser beam energy onto an asteroid with sufficient intensity to actually vaporize the asteroidal surface. Now this, this produces a thrust as the ablation of the asteroid occurs. And so with a, a researcher, Dr. Kevin Walsh at the Southwest Research Institute and Philip Leuven, we're exploring the use of these, uh, this thrust from this laser array to actually sh move the asteroid off its course. So in this particular simulation we're running right here, uh, we have an asteroid uh, in green that in its unperturbed path would collide with the Earth. This is hypothetical. There's no asteroids coming towards us that we know of. And using the laser array, we're actually able to push it away from it, from the Earth, so we don't act so we actually avoid an impact. So this is very much research in its infancy. Uh, we're trying to run more of these simulations and work at all the kinks. But it looks encouraging so far. And uh, very interestingly, if we can actually have an operating orbital control strategy for asteroids, then perhaps we can actually talk about collecting these objects which, you know, if you like resources, you don't want to mine the deep sea for them, then you could just go mine an asteroid instead if we can bring it to a close Earth orbit. So I think I'm over time, so I'll leave my conclusions up there, and I'm happy to take questions. <laughs> or we can move into the general discussion, that's fine. <laughs> okay.